welcome all of you to the Talk in the Library series, um, as, which is part of the Mary Teft White lecture series. And as many of you know, I, I won't go into the whole history um, right now, but that this was endowed uh, with, by, uh, with the gift of Mary Teft White, who was an alum of the university, who endowed this series um, for people to come in and talk to students, particularly about um, their work, their path to their work, um, and, share, and share their passion with students, hoping to inspire passion as well. Um, I also will add that there are two more talks um, coming up this semester, one of them on Monday, uh, which will be at Rogers Free Library at 7 p.m. with novelist Jennifer Haig. Uh, she'll be um, talking, I think, specifically uh, focusing on her book, Heat and Light, which some of you may have been familiar with. It was definitely on a best of lists all year last year in terms of novels. Um, and then back here on November 16th will be poet Vijay Sashradi, uh, who was the uh, 2014 Pulitzer Prize winner for, for, his, for, for his book. Um, and as I um, said just the other day in the librarians meeting, um, uh, he's not only just um, a, an incredibly moving and incredibly smart poet, but also just an incredibly um, interesting person to just be in the room with. And I think um, even if, um, I know most of you actually probably have an interest in poetry if you're here, um, but even for those of you who don't, just, just being in the room with him is worth, um, worth, your, worth your hour, um, believe me. So that's where we're going, um, but let's get to where we are. In times like these, during this day and age, given the current climate, these are all expressions that seek to bind us to the unique aspects of our generation and era. Of course, all generations see their moments of time as distinct and unique, therefore suggesting a need for their own language and vocabulary in order to fully express the gravity and severity of their time. And that is where literature comes into place, showing that in fact the language of concern, dissent, and hope transcends the specifics of the moments, and in fact usually cuts to the core of human consciousness. In other words, a sense of timelessness. And poetry is chief among the literary art forms that allows for such timelessness. Whether it is the ancient Greeks meditating on the horrors of war and the corruption of power, or the more recent catalog of so-called resistance poetry following the last election, meditating on the horrors of war and the corruption of power. Poetry allows us to see the span of human consciousness over time and through history while reaffirming a continuum of that human consciousness and thought that outlives its moment of history. Again, timelessness. Tina Kane was born in Hell's Kitchen in New York City in 1969 and grew up in the city's east and west village. She attended the University of Vermont, the Sorbonne, and completed her master's degree in French literature at Middlebury College. And another university I'm not going to pronounce. Um, she is the founder and director of the Writers and Schools in New York, uh, in, I'm sorry, in Rhode Island, for which she works as a visiting mm -hmm. poet and is also an instructor with the writing community Frequency Providence. Over the past 20 years, Tina's taught English, French, and creative writing in public and private schools throughout New York City and Rhode Island. Her poems and translations have appeared in numerous publications. And she's the author of Dear Elena, Lena, Letters for Elena Ferrante, Poems with Art by Esther Sol Solons, and, and, um, and the book Once More with Feeling, which is just out from release books. And of course, Tina is the uh, Poet Laureate of Rhode Island which um, is uh, in their second year of that. Uh, wrapping, up the first. wrapping up, going into the second year <laughs> um, uh, of that post, um, of which she'll talk some, uh, read, read, read some of her own work, talk a little about that, answer some questions as well. Um, so um, in our times like these, um, please welcome our poet laureate, Tina Kane. Thank you, Adam. Thanks, Adam Braver, and everybody here for coming, and anybody who was involved um, in bringing me here. So thank you. You know, you always think no one's going to come <laughs> when you're a poet, and sometimes people don't. So it's lovely to see you here. And um, I've never been on the campus, and it's right at the water, so it's stunning. 
Um, so I thought I'd read a bunch of work. Um, you know, I, I'm pretty shy, so um, I like to read um, because it forces me to kind of confront the work. And a lot of times, even if it's already been published, I'm rethinking it in my head as I read it. <laughs> so, um, but I'm gonna read a bunch of work from this book, Once More With Feeling. Depending, I might read some letters for Elena Ferrante, and then I'm gonna read some stuff that I'm kind of still working on that's new um, from a group of poems tentatively called work. Um, but I'll start with this poem, Sirens, um, which is about growing up in New York, and it's the first poem I wrote um, for this book, and is kind of the foundational piece of the book. Sirens. I've been meaning to tell you that the skin around her eyes was thin, with blue veins fanning out like ferns, that she was pale for a Puerto Rican, and that she spit and threw change at my feet as I waited to cross the street. To tell you that I wouldn't let her man take me for hot dogs at the Second Avenue Deli, or to Jade Mountain for pork fried rice. That I knew what a hat like that meant to say, his diamond crucifix, the way he swayed his coat, flicked sunflower seeds from between his teeth, strutting behind the line of parked cars. I've been meaning to tell you that the parking lot on the corner was not always a dorm, that I once saw her bloodied and on her back beside a car, that two kids laughed, pulling rings off her fingers as she squinted in the sun, that I put my backpack on both shoulders, readied my key, that I ran from the sound of the sirens. To tell you that my dad drove a cab for 40 years, <coughs> kept a red bean he got from an Ethiopian guy in the back pocket of his Levi's to ward off hemorrhoids. That he wrote me notes throughout the night on the margins of his fare sheet, stuff like eat yogurt for osteoporosis. That he listened to Tosca for another life in which he didn't have his foot on any pedal, didn't ever have to chase a punk ass kid to get his money back and end up buying the kid a sandwich. To tell you that he was a Jewish guy from Brooklyn, what the fuck? He'd pound the wheel, cut off, cut short, another Brooklyn fair, not going back there with no return trip over the bridge. To tell you that he drove like a pro, back when the medallion itself was a thing of beauty, deco-like, clicking, its nickel intervals with approximate precision, the weight of it enough to crush just about anything. I've been meaning to tell you that my mother and father once fought for 50 hours straight in our basement apartment off 2nd Avenue, that the table fan was set to oscillate as they worked their way through recriminations, cups of coffee, a carton of Marlboros, that my mother tossed a day's worth of meals into her flashing walk at hasty intervals as my father paced the room. I've been meaning to tell you that the girls on the block scraped pavement in their platform shoes like weights just outside our one gated window. That we often heard Peaches, the transvestite, weeping about a Hasa John from Delancey Street, or a guy from Staten Island who liked to rip her hair out. Meaning to tell you that they made the movie Taxi Driver right around the corner <coughs> the year before. That I thought my dad might have been in it since he drove a cab, had also been an actor, was once a bartender down on Bleecker Street. That he said I was too young to see such a film, and about Saturday Night Fever, my mother said, definitely not. That there was a Nordic track bought in 1996 still in its box blocking the way to the coat rack on which my dad hung his London fog, $3,000 in its pocket for me to collect as he had requested from his hospital bed, plus stacks of cash from the safe deposit box from under the mattress and the polio ricotta container in the freezer beside the Eddie's light ice cream an empty ice tray. Been meaning to tell you there was $30,000 in my purse by the end of the day. To tell you that I tried to buy a giant stuffed peacock from a shop on Christopher Street the day he died, but ended up lugging a duffel bag of 20s to Greenwood Cemetery instead to purchase a plot for him on the hill. I've been meaning to tell you that cash is how a cabbie's daughter pays her father's bills. To tell you there was a wall of books by his bed, a broken shutter on a split hinge, 
piles of newspaper clippings to be filed per a system that didn't exist. That he left his hack license on the bedstand with the pocket knife we gave him, the carnelian ring, the paper birthday crown my children made and made him wear, buried in plush animals on the carpet in their room. That there was a rucksack of photos and mementos from his old friend Wallach when my dad cleared out his place but never had the wake. To tell you that he never even opened the bag after humping it up the stairs. Just talked to Wallach in his head every day till the end about the girl in those photos, about articles he should have read. So um, this is a book about, it's about a lot of things, but a lot of it's about growing up in New York. Um, and I grew up in New York in the 70s and 80s. Between, uh, we kind of like moved every year, but between um, from Hell's Kitchen down to the East Village and the West Village, which were kind of radically different neighborhoods at that point, and they're, everything's kind of the same now. Um, but anyway, East Village was kind of, was very scrappy, and um, Tompkins Square Park is this park in the East Village that I didn't, I didn't even go into until I graduated from college because <laughs> it was so dangerous. Mm -hmm. So that's the reference here. And there's a couple other local things. A minor history of the East Village. Maybe you knew a kid who booked through Tompkins Square on a Schwinn and came out the other side without his bike and in his socks. Never mind he wasn't buying drugs, this the price of his stupidity. Or maybe you went to Gem Spa three days in a row for egg creams to flip through Interview Magazine, still a stack of color Xeroxes assembled by Andy Warhol. Or to the St. Mark's Theater to see Oh God starring George Burns. Enough you'd said, crouched on the seat, knees beneath your chin, rats scuttling the aisle for popcorn dregs. But it never was. Not when that guy died trying to sleep in a hammock on his fire escape off Avenue A. Not when the cops found a woman's head in a pot on her boyfriend's stove on Avenue B. And when you and your friends mistakenly buzzed in the guys who would beat Faye's elderly neighbor close to death, junkies high, hunting jewelry or just high. They were men you could describe to the cops, to anyone for a long time after. And when the paramedics had you stand by the stretcher as they unjammed the brake, it wasn't enough to want to take the woman's trembling hand and it wouldn't have been enough to take it. <coughs> so I'm always like worried that people think it was just such a horror show growing up there, but it was, it was wonderful too. And um, you know, I, someone asked me um, something about what's difficult about writing, and I was like, it's really difficult, and this was really difficult, this book, to, um, to reach back into the past with um, a kind of great middle, middle-aged yearning nostalgia that I have right now without being really sentimental. Um, so that's something, you know, always trying to figure out. Um, anyway, this is, uh, there's a bunch of minor histories in this book, but there's also like a whole stack of them at my house. <laughs> so a few of them are in here. Um, and this is a minor history of bodega. And bodega is what you call um, a deli on your corner. A minor history of bodega. More a mindset, the bodega was where you could get lemon heads and Mary Janes, a set of radial tires, a pack of Rough Riders, and bottles of pineapple douche. Or for two quarters, a half pint of chocolate milk to wash down your Roland's fried pork rinds, just in time for Michael Aguirre to follow up on his promise to punch you in the face, which you had dared him to do, which he later did against the brick wall near Faye's place. So when your mother, her eyes still set on her sizzling walk, said, what did you expect? You just had to snag a stack of quarters from her bag so you could stomp back to the corner for a box of Red Hots and sit on the steps of the laundromat, sucking the color from each bit of sweet before shooting it from between your teeth onto the sidewalk until the pavement around your feet was a dingy constellation charting your indifference towards any transaction that didn't first pass beneath a pane of bulletproof glass. And one more minor history. Um, this is called The Minor History of Police Work. And the little girl referenced in the poem, Diana, is the daughter of Philandro Castile. She was in the car when he was uh, murdered. A Minor History of Police Work. 
I'm trying now to live in a clear-headed tenderness that I could afford to be disorganized, defiant, delinquent even, back then when others could not, cannot still, maybe never will. I was a kid when the cops once tried to take me from my home to the station for my safety. I was several years older than Diana in that car who watched a bullet wound bloom in the driver's seat on the screen cradled in her mother's palm. Her story now replaying as the blood expands like a hand around the young man's torso, over and over, a small shadow falling across his ripped white tank. Nothing so red as that, fixed for a lifetime in my eye. Until now, nothing like that back then. Until now, I see how memory serves, may work for her, and I grieve. When I said I was safe, the cops didn't make me go, that I could not be forced. So rooted to the basement apartment that was my home. Not a car, but a room with bars on the window and a gate to the street. We didn't own a vehicle, didn't drive. My father was white, my mother was Chinese, and the police were nice to us, tried to break things up, though their very presence in our home meant broken. They let me stay. No one was speeding or failing to signal after all. We were just failing in a loud and crazy time. And whatever else we couldn't afford, we could still afford to fail. We worked with what we had, and they let us. Um, read a couple more from here. Um, I'm going to read um, Nocturne Proof. There's a series of nocturnes. Um, I really love Federico Garcia Lorca, and he really loved New York, so we have that in common. And, um, and so he wrote a bunch of nocturnes, and so I, I wrote some too. And um, this one's called Nocturne Proof. If it isn't a mother peeling an orange for her son, my mother, my son. If it isn't a soldier hiding from choppers, heart of bamboo. It is one's own father living in a tree house in his own mother's yard, unable to shed the ghosts. It is his white uniform hung on the door of a pink tiled bathroom for a final shave. Or the photo of a bride in a mini dress kept in a flowered suitcase by the door. It is a fear of fire. Memories filigreed like lace or birds scattered like buckshot from the tops of towers. And if not birds, then it is people, pixelated to grains of sand, as if information. Or children linking arms across a corridor to make a finish line. And if not them, then one's own children, climbing a shady tree, suspended in the lens of their own mother's eye. If not a rush to perceive oneself, can I see? Can I see? It is a rush to hold hands through the fire, the birds and the children. It is a push to shed ghosts. If it isn't sacred space of school bus, it is ninja lunchbox and secret coat closet, an invincible way home. If it isn't never being crouched beneath a desk, it is the right to say anything, unmolested. It is empire and oysters in the bay, a seagate spanning the entire state, it is restoration or a watermark above the sideboard that is not indelible. It is unassailable sky, indivisible sea. If not right action, then it is right speech or inviolate fatigue, possessing every frozen delicacy in the stop and shop at midnight. And trees shading trees on solitary streets. It is smoking in one's car, which is the opposite of breathing. It is wanting to do both all the same. And if not that, then it is having indelicate thoughts beneath the delicate leaves of trees, shades of one's own breathing. And um, one more nocturne. This is called Nocturne Starting Right Now. I mistook the mouth for speaking, the people for birds, the towers for totems to fire. I thought the TV was a crowd of assholes in my living room, and I was not wrong. I mistook the sky for water, hanging by my feet from a tree I thought love was a trap, 
that ideas were accidents, not the other way around. But with my feet always on the ground, I would not have seen how grass resembles rain or heard how upside down your banjo strains despondent. This will not be a poem about New York and death. New York has never been a delicate city. Like my many fathers, it raised me on mistakes and put me in harm's way, then swept in nightlike in a white jogging suit dressed like my Uncle Marty from Staten Island, who always said stuff like, Eddie never hurt anyone, always mistaking everyone for someone else. He wept from his grave when the ferry slammed into the bulkhead that day. I know. He was not a meticulous man, though I hardly knew him. But who does not lament carelessness in the face of carelessness? Why, I still mistake speaking for meaning, too often speaking of the subway and death. I take New York for my father, assholes for elsewhere in love with its delicate strain. I take it all to a rooftop in Hell's Kitchen. Warm tar molting, water towers, the whir of choppers. And I sit with it, as if a, gra a grail will rain down on me if I wait. But there are no mistakes. Starting right now, there is just a sky full of grass. I'm going to read. I didn't, I didn't tag this one, but I'm going to read a short. There's a couple of really short poems in here um, that I wrote um, when I thought this book was done, it hadn't been taken by a publisher, but then I had a friend, this poet Greg Pardlow, and he read it. He said, someone missing, and anyway, he, he really prompted me to write these small poems um, that I think ended up being really important. I'm just gonna read one. It's called Self-Portrait with Mother as Cat. My hand flickers into a paw as I lick my finger to turn the page stroke my daughter's hair, or reach to pet her feline eyes, narrowed in fury over an injustice I cannot fathom. It's that deep that we share molecules, that the cells of children live in their mother's brain for decades after they leave her body, their childhood home. It makes sense, my son says, how you sometimes know what I am thinking. How I hold the scruff of his neck as the Uptown Express rushes into the tunnel is how deep I used to lean beyond the pillar to feel the wind of West 4th Street Station warm on my face, my mother calling over the rumble. Don't let the train suck you in now. I think I'll read one last minor history, and we'll see. A minor history of night. This is about marriage. When our earliest hands dug for light in wet sand, when I swam in a bioluminescent bay, when I watched you watch me from the dock, the open water, my body so open. When they say there are fewer dark parts in the world today, I say, still as many shadows. When they say the snowy owls are confused, I say, we too. When one owl stunned by our car on the road at dusk seems poised to speak, we drive away, spooked by her intensity. Winding instead past our neighbor's riot of Christmas lights shining like a Cumberland Farms. When through the kitchen window the sleigh's glare reflects off gla glass across my chest as I rinse a dish, electric snowflakes glow superimposed like lace in my hair. When I stare out fumbling a wet cup when I see you approach, mirror behind me in the window, when the snow and dusk softening and deepening. So I think I'm going to skip the Elena Ferrantes. It's like, it's like two sides of a person in these books. They're just very different. These are epistolary poems to the Italian writer Elena Ferrante. Um, but I think I'm just going to read um, some poems from this new stuff, try them out. I've read a few of them recently. I'm still working on them. So I um, have been reading um, for months on and off. It's great because you can just dip into it. Um, Working by Studs Terkel, which came out in the early 70s. And it's just this giant book. It's a beautiful book. It's a giant book of um, transcripts of interviews he did over many years, traveling across America and just talking to all sorts of people about their work. And, you know, from this book, um, 
my publisher was great. The book designer put a little tiny yellow taxi cab on the back as a nod to some of the content, which is my dad was a New York City cab driver for like 40 years. Um, and my dad passed away about seven years ago, but um, as I've been thinking recently about this notion of work and thinking about, you know, he hated his job and what does that do to a life or to a person's um, sense of self to go to work every day at a job that you find very grueling but that you hate? And um, I think about the kinds of work that I do and that other people do. And um, I, like when I got this Poet Laureate gig, my kids were like, that's a job? <laughs> I was like, yes, apparently it is. So, so, so but I actually approach it. Um, I, I was telling Adam right before, it's a title and you get this very nominal fee. But it's a title, but I approach it like a public service job, because that's my style. I just, I, I, I like projects, and I'm really thrilled about um, the job. So, so I've just been thinking about all the kinds of work I do, but I have three children, so a lot of my work is outside of teaching and writing and, and anything else is also domestic. And, you know, it's funny, because there's a real stigma, too, around women writing too much about their domestic life. Um, but my domestic life and my interior intellectual life and my conflicts between those things are all bound up together. So they're like these threads in a big jumble and then that's me, <laughs> you know. So um, they're inextricable. And um, so I've been thinking a lot about that. And I also think what a luxury to even reflect upon liking your job. Most of the world doesn't really have that. Um, you know, most of the world's really working to live. So um, anyway, work. It starts with a line from the wonderful poet Michael Klein um, from his poem, Other Horses. I can't stop horses as much as you can't stop horses. What is work but a horse is a beast to be one with the broom I bristle. Toil, tool, and trade. Work is a poem I made, is my children is family, a broken phrase difficult to say, with a mouthful of teeth sore from grief, is another kind of work. Or driving long hours through the night, only to start each day in its middle, Spartan with a sparse meal to break the fast, a private kind of penance one man makes. While another says, we use water to start over. How Baldwin used snow from the Alps to write his way back to the Harlem streets of his youth. Whereas Debbie from Seekonk says, I'm Switzerland here, meaning you can tell me anything. And I almost do, keeping the most arduous parts of the work to myself, for myself, sometimes comparing my heart to a horse, sometimes fast and beautiful, often beastly and burdensome, with my six shades of brown in each eye, I see work in every corner of the earth. The way work always finds me where I stand, list in hand, a clover in my pocket. And um, this poem's called Systems. And um, I recently did a, a reading and a talk with Matthew Sapruder, who I love. And um, he, I had been working on this poem when we were talking about this event that we were gonna do in Providence. and. Uh, I said, hey, what do you think of this poem? I have this line from your poem that I stole and put in my poem. And he wrote me back and he said, I really like this poem. You could take out my line because it's not working. So I said, okay. So I, so I dedicated the poem to him. So it's called Systems for Matthew Sapruder. Systems. What is work but a system? A solar-powered family or animal of poverty whose hunger taste of metal is a tendency to hoard. Handed down natural as disaster, like work within trees, secret language, a system of roots. The oldest machine of reciprocity and need is my mind, the grid off which I live, that my mind might also be a tree, or a hummingbird freed from its cage, my trill tinted rose with nectar, a glow amid the aura of Etruscan women who thrill at the songs I make, of their aches and appetites. Each refrain, a wheel within a wheel, a music of lineage, ancient as math, bright as grass. House and home, house and home. 
I can't stop houses as much as you can't stop houses. Every home is a monument to industry. Every house has a skeleton of wood. I clear our refuse from the landing, the cobwebs from the bones, right? The poem that lives in my head, just as the bed wants to be made, the poem. Just as the sheets need to be cleaned, the poem. Home of living desire, house of creatures who require my touch, the poem. Just as daily love aches to be sung by night, the poem. All demand and appetite, the poem. Each day I trill industrious, a hummingbird poem of mothering my nature. The poem insists upon my presence, exerts upon my children, the poem. In my throat on waking, and at night when I take to my bed, the poem in my head. Unstoppable house and home of poem. This is a really old poem. It's like 25 years old. And um, a student who was at this Matthews Bruder event, um, a high school student came and she was wearing this t-shirt that said poet. She was great. And, so, and then she wrote to me and asked me some questions. And she said, oh, I read this poem online. And I was like, right, I haven't read that poem for years. So I read it. And um, so I'm bringing it here. Um, some Kinds of Fire. Um, the reference here is the Hotel Chelsea, which is a hotel in New York City. And uh, I lived there for a couple of years as a kid, um, one of our many stops. Um, and uh, in 1977, there was a huge fire, and, among other things, like Sid Vicious killing his girlfriend. And we lived there for both of those things. But uh, So this is about that fire and other things, some kinds of fire. Anna Akhmatova burned her poems. And the light of Madrid was like water. At La Latina Luncheonette, I ate a cup of chocolate and a motor oil churro every day for a week, recovering the cherry bomb alley that was our street, Hotel Chelsea ablaze from a rum-soaked pillow and a cigarette, 1977. Iron balconies were dropping like lace. Windows were popping like sobs. Can you describe this? Someone asked Anna Akhmatova as she stood online. Yes, she said. I can. A couple more, and then we'll wrap it up. Um, let's see. All right, so in this body of work, work, um, my 11-year-old daughter, I have three kids, but my 11-year-old is obsessed with life hacks. So she spends a lot of time on YouTube watching life hack videos. So I'll be like getting in the car and she's like, if you put hand sanitizer on the door handle, it won't freeze a lock. Or, you know, pulling on boots. She's like, if you take pool noodles, cut them in half, you can use them as boot stays. <laughs> it's like nonstop. So, so I've been thinking about this idea of life hacks. And then hack has all these other um, definitions. So, for example, my father... Um, was a cab driver who had a hack license. It's called a hack license. Um, but a hack is also like a crappy writer. Um, so this is called hack. He left his hack license on the bed stand with the pocket knife we gave him, reluctant to renew in case he didn't make it back. There was a wall of books by his bed, stacks of articles he would have read had he returned to spend the $65 on a photo of his eyes squinting into the middle distance of the gaunt days ahead. It said that every unworn shoe in a closet represents a unit of work, a mark of time wasted or money earned. But however you look, a shoe is a shoe is a shoe. An embarrassment of riches, my dad always chimed as he ripped open his gifts at Christmas time. When he finally let go, they gave me his belongings in a clear plastic bag that read belongings. I couldn't carry his clothes while also carrying my baby in my belly down into the belly of the train. I took the buckle from his belt and put the bag in the trash on the corner of Lexington Avenue, then caught the downtown express, empty-handed, brass in my pocket, unable to end even this poem the way I want it. 
I just wrote this poem really recently, this last one. Um, um, I was having um, coffee with this poet at Brown named Andrew Colarusso, and I couldn't believe how young he was. I was like, oh my gosh, I could be your mom. And, and I, I could be. And, um, and then later on that day, I was driving my kids somewhere, and um, we were all laughing how my youngest son, who's seven, the story that we tell him, he's like, he says, where was I before I was here? So I always say you were naked and flying around in the sky. <laughs> and, and then you came down. And so that's been the story. But now he's older, so he doesn't buy it. So this is a little bit about that. And it's a little bit about um, a ref. Well, it's an internal reference to a poem that Andrew Colarusso read for um, a podcast I have. And his poem is about Trayvon Martin. Youngest son. We used to laugh and say he was naked and flying around with the stars before he came down to be with us. These days, he says, when I was dead, because naked means sexy, and he's not a baby, knows what sex is, would rather be dead. But I don't want the word dead around my kids or around any mother's son, so I say, honey, you were never dead. And he says, then I fell like a raindrop into your mouth. And I say, yes. Oh, the other morning I said yes when he called fog a cloud on the ground. How he was formed is forming from rain in my mouth, just as one day I believe he will go out for sweets and come back. Just like that. For some boys like him, it may be that easy to not be a cloud called back to its rain place, for salt tears not to fill the space left in his wake. Um, so I think I'll just end with this, the first poem of this book. Sometimes I read this at the very end because it's like aspirational. It's called Wish List. Um, wish List. These are actual things I wish for. Um, to be the Mary J. Blige of poetry. To come back as Peter O'Toole. To have Peter Falk expose his tender heart to you as John Cassavetes would make a monument to love of a fragile wife with a nervous tick and strangers from a bar on the couch. To be a poet of the sea, pounding down each syllable till it resembles almost nothing but sound between lovers. To be an unscripted scene of oneself, have a teardrop tattoo inked beneath one eye. To practice right action and write speech, to summon a stiff drink upon waking at the foot of a dune, to be a grain of sand in that dune, to be seen up close at maximum magnification, intricate and entirely plausible. So I think we'll end there. So, questions? <laughs> I, think, I think we're opening up to questions, so I'm not sure if anybody has any questions. All right, so I have a question. How many of you here are studying poetry or write poetry? So, a fair amount of you. Um, <laughs> Um, are any of you here, um, <coughs> do you have um, Adam Braver as your teacher or anything? Yeah. <laughs> so who do you like to read? Who do you like to read? Um, I usually find when I need to write, I, then I read someone. You know, I, I start pulling off my shelves when I'm trying to write. So um, like one person that I love to read, and she's kind of well known on some level, and then totally unknown, Lisa Jarno. Does anybody know her? Do you like, I love Lisa Jarno, so, um, so you should look her up. J-A-R-N-O-T. I don't know where she is now. She used to be in Brooklyn. Now she's somewhere upstate being a farmer. But I'm sure she's also a poet, too. So. Uh, anybody else from New York? <laughs> yeah. Where? Uh, Westchester County. OK, OK. Yeah. I used to live in the. Uh, Upper West Side, oh, yeah, you did. I lived up there for one year, too. You moved up and moved back down. <laughs> Where on the Upper West Side? Uh, Riverside Park. Yep. Yeah. OK, 
that was 89th Street. Oh, I was 99. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's funny because when I first got the Poet Laureate appointment, um, literally hours after I got an email from someone at a nursing home inviting me to be at a nursing home, I was like, wow, I've never done that. So, um, so I went out to a nursing home in Barrington. And it was great because I was joking with my friend after. I said, well, you know, it's amazing because, you know, when you get to a certain age, apparently, you can appear to be completely asleep and then, like, wake up suddenly and ask a really smart question and then like get the answer and go back to sleep. <laughs> and, and then also like apparently everyone is from Brooklyn. Like, everybody afterwards came up, like a sea of women came up and they were like, I'm from Brooklyn. I'm from, obviously they all had come here like during the 40s and the 50s. Or, so, um, so I find that sometimes people come up and they're like, I'm from New York or and we moved away. Um, yeah. I have a question. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I have a comment too. I just pre really, especially love the, the description of your father's medallion. <laughs> something you had seen countless times. Yeah. Something you had many thoughts on. How did you funnel it down to that when you're making a decision in your work to have that sort of, you know, definitive description of it? How many, you know, iterations of it or versions do you go through as you think about it? You know, I have to say I revise a lot, but that poem, Sirens, um, I got asked this a while back by Brooklyn poets, and I, the, I said the only thing that I can um, compare the writing of that poem to is like um, the unfurling of a Super 8 movie. Um, I don't remember writing the poem. It was really, um, and that's very rare. Usually, I'm like you know anguishing and do millions of drafts. Um, so I, with that particular image, it just came out like that, and that's rare. So, um, but that poem kind of set off a whole bunch of other work. Um, and I think it was um, uh, because it was one of those poems that needed to be written. Um, so, and you know, I I think the medallion also has all of these other connotations that aren't in the poem. But um, miraculously, I met another poet whose father was a cab driver in Queens. So we were talking shop, and she was like, her dad had bought a medallion in the 70s, and it was really expensive because my mom was always telling my father, you should just buy the medallion, and take out a loan, and he never wanted to do it because he always wanted to stop driving the cab and do something else. Um, so he missed the boat on that because they, then they were like, you know, they were $100,000 in 1975, but then in 1995, they were a million and a half dollars, you know, so they were worth a lot of money. Now with Uber, they're like worth nothing, so I don't Uber. I can't, it's like my dad would just, <laughs> can't do it. So, but, um, but uh, the physicality um, of cash, and, and I mean, like the part about the cash in the poem, that's true. Like I literally was walking around with you know, $30,000 in my bag and I literally went to Greenwood Cemetery with a duffel bag of money. And, um, but the physicality of the medallion and the, the, the physicality of the exchange of cash as we move towards a cashless society, really seem like um, almost like historical um, notes, um, and so, and 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 that deco like is hearkening even further back, you know. But you know, I, um, you know, I still remember there were these little rumble seats and checker cabs for kids, the little seats that folded down, and you'd sit and face the other way, and you know. It was such a different time. There were no seat belts, nothing, you know. And my friend was with me, and she, this cab driver stopped short, and she lost her front teeth because she flew into the back of the cab from the rumble seat. And it was just a much more unrestrained era. And so, um, but truthfully, I don't know. I don't know how that came out. <laughs> so, um, but, yeah. Um, you opened by talking about the risks of sentimentality when you're writing about those personal things. Yeah. Like the medallions and the physical objects, you've got a lot of that in there. Can you talk to our students a little bit about how to be truthful and honest without being sentimental, and what's the problem with sentimentality? In there? I don't know that I'm an authority on any yeah. of this, um, but but um, uh, and sometimes what happens. So, for example, with that short poem, self-portrait, um, "Mother Is Bird," that my friend Greg, um, he's you know he said. Uh, there's someone in the book that's not in the book. 
And it took like three hours of talking for it to come out. I was like, all right, it's my mom. I was like, she's in there. And he's like, but she's not really in there. And he didn't even know really what it was, but he could feel an absence that was very present. So he said, you need to go and write a bunch of really crappy poems about your mom. And just get it out, and then it won't be anathema to find that presence where it pops up. Because I think that my feeling was that it was too direct and crossing over into sentimentality if I talked too much about her or her presence, or if I alluded too much too directly to it. So, um, so it was, you know, I'm not a big believer in like poets being brave. You know, that's a thing that. You know, uh, so I won't say it was brave, um, but I do think that it felt um, really uncomfortable to to write that poem and then put it in the book. Um, but I think it was important too. So I think that um, sometimes when you're writing something that's very personal and you're feeling like you're risking sentimentality, um, that's when you have to go through the multiple drafts and really push through and kind of shed all of the, um, they carve it down and kind of think, what's the point of what I'm trying to get across here and not, um, kind of shroud it with feelings, because there is a kind of falseness, too, that sentimentality can end up achieving. And so I think that when something is very uh, visceral, and when a, a writer, if they're writing personally and it feels vulnerable, is really truly exposing a vulnerability, there is no sentimentality. That's not what that is. Sentimentality is the false version of the real thing. And I think that my kind of trying to steer clear of it is um, because if I'm doing that, then I might as well not be doing it. I really struggle. But it's a struggle. It's not, and you know, uh, someone might read this book and be like, geez, you know, this is what a sentimental journey to the past, um, which is not my intention. And so some of that is subjective obviously. Um, but then there are other things that are really quite objective. Like, you know, you feel like, you know, your experience, there's a universality you want to get to in that your experience is like everyone else's, but not in the particulars, in the, in the, the, the archetypal emotional landscape of it. So, um, but there's nothing wrong with, not sentimentality, but emotion and real connection. And I think that, um, you know, sometimes, um, and Matthew Sapruder and I were talking about this, he wrote this great book we should all buy called Why Poetry? It's a great book. But he, so we were talking about, um, I forget what we were talking about, but something around, um, it was like about John Ashbery and people sometimes feeling they can't enter into his work. Like it's too intellectual or snarky or offhanded or strange. Um, and so we were kind of saying that there's also this kind of whole offshoot of that snarky intellectual work that is not John Ashbery, but that um, verges so clear of emotion and sentimentality that it's difficult to connect to it because it's very protective. The, so sometimes language, you know, can use a lot of language and not really be saying anything, but sometimes language also serves as a barrier almost. So um, I think that you're always verging towards sentimentality because it's familiar. And then you have to step back and think about what is the, um, the essence of the experience I'm trying to write about that's completely individual to my lexicon, my emotional and linguistic lexicon, you know, and revise the hell out of it. <laughs> Except in isolated instances, you know. Um, yeah. Okay. Sure.
Yeah. They're afraid of it. Yeah. They, they're not sure yeah. how to read it. Yeah. They don't read it. Yeah. Same with law school. Yeah. They don't read it. Yeah. They're well, so yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, and this is Zabruder's book. I'm not here as a paid, you know, <laughs> as a paid person for Matthew Zabruder, but this book, Why Poetry, really addresses this, um, the way to poetry is taught and approached. But um, I think that poetry and philosophy um, can overlap in the sense of, um, I mean, I feel that poetry, the best poetry is really like a, a, the fruit of the synthesis of the emotional and the intellectual kind of fused or shot through the prism of language so that, um, y you know, like I was saying, the kind of snarky, kind of clever intellectual stuff, if it's not, like John Ashbery stuff, there are poems that are heartbreaking and they're just so strange and random, but somehow they're getting at you. Um, and then there's some stuff where I'm just not connecting to it at all. So I think that the best work kind of fuses um, the intellectual and the emotional and connects with the reader. There has to be um, some way of connecting to the reader. But I think that poetry is also um, in the realm of ideas um, in the sense that, I don't know, I'm. I'm interested in ideas, like just as a concept, work as a concept, and that 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 idea in and of itself will give rise to a bunch of poems, right? And I think that um, you know, in some of this work, there's right action, right speech, and that is you know that comes from B Buddhism, and that my grandparents, you know, um, principles of um, of ways of being and um, uh, ways of um, comporting and interacting in the universe, right? So these, I don't know if they're philosophical or um, metaphysical or just um, um, how to get through daily life, <laughs> um, but I can I can I can say that I think that mm -hmm. if a person is um, reluctant or afraid of ideas, that they're never going to want to read poetry or philosophy um, because they're idea rich and um, and and that I think is where they overlap and like that poem systems. Um, I wrote it with Matthew Subruder in mind because I was thinking about the like some of the things that he says about poetic state of mind and lucid dreaming being a kind of, like lucid dreaming is what poetry is and how poets think and how they synthesize ideas or concepts and, and express them in poetry. So um, I think that, you know, for your students, if they're afraid of philosophy or uh, afraid of poetry, it really has to do with um, a fear of the abstract or a fear of the possibility of abstraction, you know? And I think that's more a cultural problem because other cultures have different, have different tendencies, but um, like in France, when I was a student in France, you know, it is considered a kind of a defect of character not to mm -hmm. at least pretend that you were interested in poetry and philosophy. <laughs> I don't know if everybody in France really is, but you know, but, but, but certainly it was, it was part of, you know, part of um, being a person in the world. And, and certainly education-wise, coming up through in a French education, you know, that was, it was rich on the, the poetry and the, and the philosophy. So these are cultural questions too. Um, you know. Any other questions? All right, so I'm going to just tell you a couple of things that you should look out for um, from the poet laureate side of my job. So um, if you ride the buses, anybody ride the bus? If you ride the buses, um, in September I launched with the Poetry Society of America um, a, a very beloved, that I loved, and long-standing program from the New York City um, subway system called Poetry in Motion. 
and I brought it to the Rhode Island bus system, RIPTA. So um, about 70% of the fleet now has these digital screens that are sort of like TV screens behind the driver. And um, they have like uh, Cardi's ads and, you know, um, Benny's, no longer Benny's, but ads for other things. And, and then you'll also see poems come up. So that's what that is. It's public display of poems in the transit system. So uh, September was Walt Whitman. And right now, there's an excerpt from uh, a poem called Remember by Joy Harjo. And then on November 15th, we're going to change it over to Pablo Neruda. And then um, I think December, if I can get the rights to it, um, Fernando Pessoa, who's a Portuguese poet. And then 2018's all Rhode Island poets. So you can look for that if you're on the bus or you know, tell your friends. <laughs> so, um, all right, well thank you. Thanks a lot, thank you. Thank you.